It's because so many people here see Dr. Dragon and his philosophy, his thoughts from different perspectives. Some have formed their view of him through his writings, his works, some through close personal interaction, and some through maybe fleeting interactions but from which they've discerned some of these traits that people talk so glowingly of. And so today we're going to, I think, because there's so many people here and I'm sure everyone would want to share some thought, I'm going to just confine myself to a few ideas. So Clement made the point about Dr. Jagan's philosophy, his teachings, and what he would do in a modern day context. And he, and he clearly stated, we don't know. We can guess based on his teachings, but each of us would have probably and can find some justification in his work to justify any approach that we wish to, to say that he would have pursued in a particular manner. But times have changed too. And our erstwhile friends may have not been so vocal in their support of us in the modern era. And so take, for example, the question of democracy, which has loomed so large in our lives and his life and his struggles. The return of freedom to Guyana there was a straight line explanation for it historically. The West did not want us to come to power and Chedi Jagan to prevail. So they created disruptions in our society and collaborated with the PNC to keep us out of power for a very long time. And we had a clear an enemy that was hostile to democratic return of democracy in the country. And also, we knew who their supporters were. But come to 2020 now, and we had a deafening silence from the same people who were our friends of the past, and it was the Americans who may have contributed for a very long time to us being disenfranchised and the loss of freedom in Ghana, they were in the forefront of supporting the People's Progressive Party for return to democracy in this country when it was challenged. So the context changed too. And the former enemy became our friend for that, on that issue and for that period. So things have changed. Things have changed. And I heard the little polemics between Clement and Donald on the whole issue of Ukraine. And I think Clement was quite clear as Chedi as a nationalist and a thinker. And particularly, the Chedi Jagan in government would have been different than the Chedi Jagan in opposition. I recall when we had to agree to the privatization of a number of public enterprises that were a drain on the treasury, could not allow, they took up too much of the resources, the limited resources we had in a very fiscally stressed situation, Chedi Jagan made the conscious decision. He looked at the reality and he said, at Queen's College, 
walking between the raindrops. It meant with the IMF program, we had to go forward with it. And the consequence of that program was to get rid of several of the loss-making enterprises. We worked our way through the IMF program, and by 2006, we were free of it. From 2006, many people don't know about that. But he had to make a decision. We were opposed to privatization. But philosophically, and as leader of the opposition, and maybe in opposition, but when confronted with the reality of managing a budget and making sure you had more money for education and health care and the other things, and these loss-making enterprises were not contributing welfare to people, and they were a drain on the Treasury, he made that rational decision. And so too, as a leader, where a country now like ours is, Donald said, that the history of the matter in Ukraine is grounded in history. And so too is the Venezuelan aggression against our country. So too is the Venezuelan. They can claim it's grounded in history. And should we say that just history, because you have a dispute between a neighboring country, then the history justifies intervention in a country, then what do we do? Who will be our friends when Venezuela decides to take this very same route in Guyana's case? And then I agree that Russia needs geopolitical security. But if I live in an independent country, this is my country, and I decide I want to join any alliance, and that's the sovereign desire of my people, then how could a country next door say that if you don't refuse, the people of that country don't refuse to join that alliance, then they can come in and take over my country just to prevent me and my country and the sovereign decision of my people from becoming part of an alliance. There must be something fundamentally wrong with that. And that is what we have to confront. So one, Chedi Jagan, maybe as a government leader, would have had to take a position strong against aggression against third parties. And secondly, there has to be other ways of ensuring Russian geopolitical security without taking away the right of a country of to self-determination. Because then where does it stop in the world? any part of the world. Brazil doesn't like us doing something, joining some CARICOM, so they say, we'll come and take over the country because we don't like you being CARICOM because CARICOM threatens our security. They should take that issue there. So I'm not going to belabor this issue. It's just that we have to look at things and think them out logically. What about the people? We're all for peace. Chedi Jagan would have been for peace. But also the issue of justice is very important in everything that, that we do. So many people say how, and again, Clement raised the point about how would a Chedi Jagan operate in a context in a modern day economy? When Chedi Jagan took Guyana over from APNU, we were a per capita GDP of 300 US dollars. When he died, we were just over $1,000. Today, we're $7,000 per capita. We were using the debt was 900% of GDP, external debt. 
Today, it's 17% of GDP. We're using 153% of revenue to service debt. Now it's 6% external debt. The APNU in the five years didn't contribute much to that. Didn't contribute any to that. That's the success of the PPP. That's the success of the PPP, transforming, taking us insolvent country and today making it to the most viable economy in the Western hemisphere with the lowest debt figure in this region, the lowest. And it is because we are guided by some principles. So it's the principles that often matter. That of, we talk a lot about the Chetty jargon and the experience, the speeches, but it's the underlying principles that were embedded in the party that would allow us to be successful. So when a lot of people talk, bilge out there about departure from Chetty jargon, uh, philosophy and all of that, it's utter nonsense. Because I know, I, I recall, and I, as I said before, you discern big, big philosophies and principles from small interactions. I recall how intense he was about understanding just basic things that you would think he had no interest in. I was at state planning one day and Chetty Jagan got a document. At that time, the IMF documents were like secret documents when Apnu was there. And he called over some people, and he saw two inflation rates in there. And they couldn't explain and call, call all of us over. I was at their planning. One was headline, and one was core inflation. He was curious to the point of understanding details. And then this philosophy of also understanding growth expansion. That is why the industrial estates were built, not for consumption-based philosophy. So when I pointed out that the oil money, we haven't used a sentence of it, of it as yet, but in this budget, we have integrated it, and we have integrated it in a manner consistent with that philosophy of a long-term growth and expansion of welfare. The capital budget grew by over 100% over last year the recurrent budget by less than 20%, because that's the only way you can avoid the excesses of some countries, the Dutch disease, and the only way you can expand the economy for future growth. It's long-term thinking. Long-term thinking, ensuring that the economy remains viable for the future. And that philosophy is not gonna change. The same fiscal discipline that Chetty Jagan had, that we have brought to the modern day context of managing oil and gas money, because that's crucial. Many countries that don't have that fiscal discipline, they splurge when they have windfalls. And that is why they're poorer whenever the resources disappear. And these are resources that come in in a very volatile manner to the treasury or to the, in our case, the Natural Resource Fund. So that fiscal discipline, the principle, I want to answer that question. How would a Chetty Jagan operate? Well, he would do so with the same fiscal discipline that his party imbued. One of the reasons our party was successful for so long, we lost the elections and then we came back and won it again, and we're the most viable party, single party, 13 other parties contested against us in the last elections, if you look at the coalition and the others. And we as a single party won, because it goes back to what the openness that he caused in this party. Donald mentioned about the 60s and the aggression. And although we were so traumatized, he didn't allow the trauma of the riots in the period to change this view on inclusion of people of every race. In fact, thereafter, just thereafter, he argued vociferously that our party must remain open to people of all races. 
in this country, all classes, all races. And because our party is like that, regardless of what they say about us, you know, APNU can only talk racism because they have nothing else to talk about. No accomplishment, no, no, no plans for the future, no track record. So they can only use race. Our party can show inclusion. We can show that we've worked for Guyana. The entire country move forward. Afro-Guyanese did better on the PPP tenure than they did under any period in PNC in government because our party remain open. And because we're open, we are viable. We are viable and we'll grow in strength, uh, uh, from strength to strength. So again, that is a crucial philosophy that we don't wear on our shoulders. We don't wear this on our shoulders, um, but it is almost runs through our DNA. It's part of our DNA runs through our blood to remain open in the party to pe people of, of every race. Another, another thing is the depth of the intellectualism in our party. People sometimes say, last in 20, pre-2015, the AFC and the others pulled a farce on the country. They presented themselves as the intellectual middle and all of that. But they were shallow, hopeless. And, and the five years in government, government demonstrated that. This party has great intellectual depth, which it doesn't really wear on its shoulder and make it very visible to people because we're proud of our working class philosophy. We believe in the private sector. We encourage the private sector. We support the private sector. But again, the philosophy of the party, you look at this, this budget, just this budget as a demonstration of that. We have money in the budget to prepare 30,000 house lots of the 50,000 we promise in this year's budget. We, we've, we're taking, we're gonna double the old age pension. We're going to double, well, in fact, take the children's grant to 50,000. I can, I can list all of the social things that we've had here in the budget because that's what we believe in. We're gonna, with all the escalating prices now, We've been hit hard by cost of living, but the world has been hit by this because of COVID and prices have gone up. But, and, and now with the, with the Russian um, Ukrainian crisis, we, it would even probably go up more. But we will keep the, the electricity prices the same way and, and water prices because we'd have to subsidize it to make sure that the impact is not felt by ordinary people. We have tons of money. We, we reverse all the hardship tax that APNU did on farmers, uh, tr increasing the water charges by 500% on land rental charges, licensing fees, etc. That's where the social approach of the party comes forward. But we recognize you have to earn money to spend. APNU thinks you have to spend all the time. And we pointed out the difference in philosophy. In five years, in five years of their government, every single one of those years, they spent less on their capital budget. That is to build roads, schools, hospitals, et cetera, than we spent in 2040. We budgeted in 2040, in every one of those five years. But a recurrent budget, that's where they expanded the vehicles that they bought or the, like the dietary and a whole range of consumables that increased by over 70%. It's, it's a fundamental difference. And the difference is Chedi Jagan philosophy too. That, that is part of our DNA. So we don't, we don't talk too much about it. Every manifesto has reflected this, what the party stands for. So I, when, when I hear a lot about oh, departure, I think it's very superficial. They don't understand and, but what Chetty Jagan has done to this country and what he has left for his party. They don't understand it. And that is, we are remaining faithful to those issues. We've been a fierce fighter. 
for the people of this country. We'll protect democracy. We'll make sure that the poor people in the country progressively do better. We'll ensure that their children get educated, the gold scholarships, free education, university education before the end of this term, all of that. We'll make sure we do the modern health care. We'll try to bring people together. And on issues like gas and the others, we will be have a nuanced position because many people talk about, they would cite, oh, somewhere Chedi made a speech, Dr. Jagan made a speech about the Puerto Rican model. But after he made that speech, 20 years later he became president and encouraged foreign capital. That is, the Puerto Rican model he was critical of was industrialization by foreign capital. But 20 years later, he became president and Change, basically encourage that because why? To build the four FPSOs will take 30 billion US dollars. If we take all of our savings and every Guyanese, all of our money in the banks, now it's less than 3 billion, 10 times less than what it will take just to build the, the four FPSOs. But we have to get them built so we can get some money from them and we have to get a fair share. And Chedi, Chedi Jagan, that's why we pass a local content legislation to put pressure on people. This is Chedi Jagan philosophy at work. It's not like a, a dumb, dumb thing, sort of thing where we'd walk in. He is, was one of the most nimble persons. I've sat with him, listened to him, nimble mentally, and very shrewd, clever. We can't be straight line. We have in this world to navigate, you have to be shrewd, you have to be clever, you have to work, look out for your, your people's interests wherever they come, the, the benefits come from. And that means having nuanced policies. Thank you very much. Good.